today we will talk about his work, his work and his work. And so, very much forward to you. Thank you, Piers. And thanks for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, to come uh, to a talk, which is uh, from a local guy, so where you maybe know already what he is doing or you think what he is doing. And uh, so I really appreciate this. I was just checking out when I was the last time giving a presentation in the Astronomical Colloquium, so it's several years ago. I first thought it was not that many, but when I was compiling this presentation, I just thought, let's just show the new things which happened over the last five years. I was compiling more and more slides, and then I was at like 200 slides, and then I thought this might be a little bit too much for this now. 45 minutes. So I was cranking down again and trying to present you just some highlights of what we have been doing recently up on the mountain on the Greenwich Group. So already with my presentation, with my head slide here, you get already a flavor of what we are doing. So you see on the upper right there are some planets showing up, so we want to form them. We want to form them out of little tiny dust grains. And we believe that the disks around young stars are the birthplace for planets. So this is our object of research. Here you see some numerical simulations of um, hydrodynamic instabilities in disks, so density structures. Here you see vortices having formed. And everything we want to combine in a story which is in the end quantifiable and making predictions on what kind of planets are forming. The research I'm doing, is, uh, which I'm presenting today, is done here by a lot of past PhD students, master students, bachelor students, which were joining us on the mountain, and also some external collaborators like Barbara Apolano and Peter Rodenheimer. I will also use a few slides kindly provided by Richard Nelson, Oliver Dressel, Matt Kunz, and Jeff Ravizur, whenever this is useful. So, just, just uh, uh, two weeks ago, I was at a conference in Los Angeles. It was from the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics. So I get once in a while, meanwhile, invitations from the geophysical fluid flow community. And what I'm showing them is something interesting. And this is that our disks are basically nothing else but very fast rotating stars or very fast rotating planets which are due to the centrifugal forces extremely slim. And then if you assume this, that uh, this is just a very fast rotating star, then you can already start to compare things which are occurring in one object to things occurring in the other one. So on the right side, you see here actually uh, the, the polar vortex on, on Saturn, and on this gas giant. And you see here, around the polar cap, there is very uh, fast rotation. So you see there's radiant shear in the system. And you see that here these bands are forming, these are zonal flows. And at the same time, little vortices are emerging out of this entire flow structure. And on the left-hand side, this is not the polar cap of a planet or of a rotating star. But what you see there is the distribution of vorticity in the midplane of a disk. And also there you find continuously the formation and decay of little vortices in this simulation. So you find a lot of similarities in the behavior of planetary atmospheres uh, in comparison to protoplanetary disks or places where actually planets will be forming one day. So in both cases, also the, the driving mechanism, at least for this instability, is the same. It's the difference in the radiation at various locations of your object. So, for instance, for Saturn, the irradiation along uh, the equator is, of course, stronger than at the, at the polar cap. And this temperature gradient leads then to all these fluid phenomena. The same is true here for all protoplanetary disks. Also here, the inner parts of the disk are stronger and irradiated, and therefore hotter than the outer regions of the disk. And again, it's a temperature gradient which is setting the entire dynamics in here. Today I will talk about star formation, planet formation, but also talk about of a lot of instabilities, which I thought I'm already mentioning here at this time, just to frighten you a little bit, that this will be a very unstable talk here. Barometric, Schubert Fricke, convective overstability, and oh, many things more. But let's start slowly. I said that 
planets are born in disks, and disks are probably the cradles where they are growing up. So, as an introduction, not only in, in public talks, I also like to use this in, in scientific talks, is to remember you that, and, and I have to remember myself, that these disks are not only a theoretical concept in my computer, but that they really exist. So, for instance, if you're looking for disks, you have to find young stars. If you want to find young stars, you have to go to a star formation region, like this wonderful Orion Nebula here, and if you take now your zoom telescope, which you have somewhere on the mountain, then you can go deeper and deeper in this nebulosity, and at some resolution, you suddenly start to find some black dots in here, so that this is not dirt on the CCD. If you go closer and closer, then we have really found here a disk around a young star. Most of you know this image, so it's a disk as seen from the side, and there's a little bit of light coming out on top and on the bottom of it, so because the light is just scattered in our direction here. So, but you cannot look inside the disk, at least not at this wavelength. And the reason that you cannot look inside this is that it's full of this little dust grains. But the dust grains are not bad, they are good, because this is the material out of which we want to form the planets one day. So, as I said, the birthplace of planets are the disks, and if we would have a um, much better telescope, or maybe would be able to send some satellite probe over to another planetary uh, system in birth, it might be looking just like this. You have here this dirty gas full of dust and ice grains rotating the young star. You see that the dust grains are colliding with each other, forming larger and larger objects, eventually of planet size, and if you are reaching a critical size, you might be able to form gas giants. Of course, this stage, exactly this image here, I think will not be possible for the next, I don't know, how many hundred years. What we have to live with is the best observable initial conditions for planet formation, which would be the information that we have about circumstellar disks, and compare them to observational data on the occurrence rate of planets around stars of a certain type. So on the other slide here again, another example for the silhouette of the disk seen from the side. This time the background is not ionized, therefore you don't see this nice contrast here. But you see scattered light indicating that actually here is a bar, actually a disk, which is just hiding whatever is in between. So you try now to make as many observations as possible of such disks to get an idea what is their mass distribution, what is their lifetime, and this would then be the initial condition for climate formation. On the other hand, you observe here radial velocity information on uh, uh, when, when a star is brought to wobble because it's orbited by a planet. And of course we know that meanwhile there are more than 1,000 of these objects observed, so we can actually start to make statistics. So we are not as rich yet as our friends which are studying the evolution of galaxies, which have hundreds of thousands of objects, but at least we already have some uh, decent size for a statistical center. So the initial condition I said is a disk, which I already indicated by little worlds, which might be turbulent, so this will be the topic later. And then you do not see much more of the planet formation process, only that, let's say, at least 10 to 7 years later, suddenly you're starting to discover a planetary system. And now you have a wonderful playground for theorists. So anything which happens between the disk stage and the planetary system stage is now something which has to be filled with life. So it's a kind of black box in which you can throw now your ideas of planet formation and then see whether everything makes sense, whether everything is plausible, and whether things are observationally testable. So, oops. So, my current favorite understanding of planet formation looks roughly like this. So, inside this turbulent disk, as I said already, we have little tiny dust grains. These dust grains are hitting each other mutually because of relative velocities, partly due to sedimentation, partly due to turbulence and radial drift. So, uh, coming up to centimeter sizes, 
then things are getting concentrated in the turbulence until gravity becomes important. You get then uh, gravity turbulent fragmentation of the particle layer that these planetesimals are forming in here. If you have many planetesimals, then you can form here the Earth out of the system. And if you have then a very large Earth, would say like six or seven Earth masses, then you are starting to accrete gas and you can form Jupiter. So, this slide here was done in collaboration with Stein und Weltraum. So, a few years ago, when we thought we had a rough idea how planets are forming, there is now one step which might be changing in the very near future. And this is uh, Chris Orme and, and, and myself are working on a different way how to come from planetesimals to, uh, to here to this Earth-sized objects. And this is not that you're simply combining here individual planetesimals, but that you're actually accreting a lot of small material on one of these planetesimals. So something which now in the literature occurs as, as parallel accretion. So, but right now it's undecided what actually the right pathway would be. So, is it first everything in planetesimals and then coming to this Earth course or giant planet course, or is it here some, some middle uh, path which also brings pebble accretion into it? So, I guess in the next four or five years I will have to revise this slide. So, once you have a gas giant, gas giants are very massive, they are starting to interact with each other in the disk, but also with the disk, and this means they are opening gaps, they are forming spirals, they are migrating inward, outward, so everything becomes very complicated, I could give an entire talk about the riddles of migrations, which we understand less and less the more we study it, but today we stay at, at more turbulent earlier states of the disk. So, of course, these are just individual processes here, which I'm displaying here. All these processes can be studied individually. So, we are doing global simulations on that stage of MHD stuff. Here we do some local simulations, sometimes spatially resolved, sometimes not. Here's Dudelman's group has been putting a lot of energy in, into this kind of simulations. We have other simulations here where we are just studying this conversion from dust into planetesimals, and same is true for the formation of the Earth planets from planetesimals, and so forth and so forth. This means these are basically seven, eight different kinds of simulations which have to be done here, one after the other. So it's impossible to have one big, gigantic simulation which is doing everything at the same time in 3D with MHD and radiation and so forth. So the strategy is now that you are picking each individual sub-step and you're driving, uh, and trying to derive characteristic parameters from this, which you can then use in a kitchen sink model. And the kitchen sink model is also known as synthetic populations, as population synthesis, as here in Heidelberg performed uh, together with, with the Bern group and Christoph Modazini, uh, postdoc in Heidelberg. So he just gave a presentation on this, I think it was last winter, roughly about this. So to remind you, in these models you are using parameters from all these various sub-steps which I've shown you before and you throw them into a disk model, a disk which is viscously evolving, here reaching from point 0.1 to 10 astronomical units. So the surface density is changing over time, here over a time for 2.5 million years. What I'm plotting here in colors are regions which have different pressure slopes and different uh, and, and different thermal relaxation times in the disk, which then has influence on the migration behavior of planets. And you see the migration behavior of planets, because you see here seven test planets have been thrown into it. Blue are still the small ones, just a fraction of an Earth size. So you see that planets are sometimes migrating inward, can be trapped in certain regions. So green at this size, planets are the type 1. They can actually migrate outward until they are getting to another trap. So they would be then converging here. If they are too massive, they again start to migrate radially. So in the, you see already what everything has been thrown in this. Furthermore, there's already a recipe in where planetesimals have been forming, how planetesimals get accreted into the gas giants, and also how much uh, mass the planets are able to accrete from the disk. 
So if you have all this in there, and now you choose your random initial positions for your cores, random uh, mass distribution in the disk, then you can study to explore the importance of the stellar properties like metallicity, its mass, its luminosity, and so forth, and make them predictions of what kind of star should have what kind of planetary system. So you see here a whole bunch of evolution tracks. So this is now like also plotted in observations, distance from the star, and here you have various masses between one and ten to four Earth masses. You see that planets here are sometimes so always start here at low masses, migrating outward as they are growing, then sometimes inward again. And when the disk is gone after a few million years, then they stop wherever they have just been at the time when the disk is dissolved. So, and so this is the only chance then to compare or to test your individual physics steps. So if you can, if you can make now predictions or artificial distributions which look like observed distributions, then you know that your model is not necessarily true and correct, but at least it's plausible. So, and I think this is right now the stage of the end. For instance, just a few years ago, uh, none of these population synthesis models worked. So and the main reason for this not working was that in our way back understanding of type 1 migrations, planet were always, planets were always migrating radially inward at a very high speed. And the only way in order to stop these planets from growing a little bit and then disappearing and getting swallowed from the central object was that the developers around Willy Benz had been introducing a fudge factor. They said migration rate, the direction is okay, but we are reducing it by a factor of a hundred to a factor of a thousand. And only by having this fudge factor, completely not understood where this should come from, it was possible to save at least a few planets in that, in these kind of simulations. But things have improved. So, uh, we had been doing better simulations of migrations, also in collaboration with Willy Gley in Tübingen, where we found that if you do the proper thermodynamics in your migration simulation, in your hydrodynamic simulations of migrating planets, then suddenly type 1 migration planets can migrate outward. So, and Karl Martin Wittkes, PhD student at the Institute, has been putting this new recipe into the population synthesis, and now the fudge factor is no longer necessary. So, this was a nice way how we could test our underlying physics. So, that we said migration, did we really already understand it? And just for population synthesis, you could say, no, it must be not understood. Migration theory cannot be right because then we would not have plants. So, two things which we are trying to put into population synthesis and on what we are actively working is that we would like to know what is the spatial and size distribution of planetesimals which have to be used in such a uh, population synthesis code. And as the other one I already mentioned, migration and accretion rates of these gigantic planets. So, spatial and size distribution of planetesimals, right now in the population synthesis you simply say everything is of a fixed size, like 100 kilometers, and it follows in its surface density distribution just the slope which you already have in your gas disk. But there is no justification of it and no observational test, because planetesimals are of such a size that they are not observable and not detectable. So, we, the idea is now that planetesimals are forming from local concentration of dust grains. So, this is already a very old idea. So, already, already Goldreich and Walsh thought that dust grains might be sedimenting to the mid plane. The mid plane layer gets so enriched in solids that self gravity takes over, and that then suddenly spontaneous gravitational fragmentation of the dust layer occurs and you're forming plants. So, a few years ago, we did numerical simulations of this, so, and where you find that dust is indeed sedimented to the mid-plane, but then, starting at some point, the vertical shear leads to some additional instability. You never reach the critical density for, uh, for self-gravity, but the gas is simply turbulent in the mid-plane, and you still have not formed any planetesimals in here. But, the, this kind of sedimentation would only be possible if the disk 
was completely laminar. So just like on a, uh, on a nice day when there's no wind, then you can find all the dust grains settling to the ground. But if it's stormy, then everything is getting uh, shaken around. And disks are, as we know from indirect evidence, really turbulent. So we, are, we have not observed turbulent magnetic fields in disks. We have not observed turbulent velocity patterns. We only have indirect evidence of turbulence. We see that there is some non-thermal line broadening in disks. And we see the following effect. We see that the disks are accreting, or let's say that the star in the center of the disk is accreting gas from the disk. And this accretion rate here is somewhere between 10 to minus 10 uh, uh, solar mass per year, 10 to minus 6 solar mass per year. This accretion rate is decaying over time. But it's decaying very slowly over time, so like over 10 million years. This means you must be able to sustain an accretion process over several million years. And in other words, it's not possible that you just accrete the last 100 kilometers of material sitting above the star, but that you really have to use the huge mass reservoir of the disk at large radii. But at large radii, of course, a gas disk has a lot of angular momentum. And if you do not remove the angular momentum from this disk, then the gas cannot fall into the sky. So in this removal of any momentum, we think, is driven by some turbulent processes. There have been uh, a lot of candidates in the past and still today which have been invoked to explain this turbulent. One thinks that if it's not just some systematic fields which might be shuffling mass around, which is also difficult to argue for, then it might be one of these candidates. So the first one, self-gravity, uh, is, is wonderfully working, but only for very massive disks. So this means that maybe for the first 100,000 years, the disk is actually accreting and is turbulent just because of its own self-gravity, because it's then massive and relatively cool. People then have been looking for more than 100 years for nonlinear shear instability at some critical Reynolds number. Everything is motivated by having some experiments, experiments in the laboratory where you have to a rotating cylinder where the inner cylinder is rotating faster than the outer cylinder. And if you have a situation where the um, inner, no, where the outer cylinder is, um, sorry, where the inner cylinder is rotating much faster than the outer one, then you can get into a regime where this wonderful uh, system is completely turbulent. You see wonderful turbulent structures in there. But if the uh, inner uh, cylinder is not fast enough, in a way that you have a rotation profile in which the angular momentum outward does not decrease but increase, then this entire thing is really stable. And this is exactly the situation which you have in a disk around any uh, compact object. In such an object, the angular momentum increases with distance to the center. Even the rotation profile means it's rotating slower and slower at larger value. And this is rotationally extremely stable. Still, there's a huge fight um, in, the, in the community. So some people just argue by hand waving that they are just your Reynolds number is large enough higher than what you can achieve in the laboratory, then things might be completely different. It also would, do, would have to be much larger than what you can achieve currently on a computer. And these Reynolds numbers are also at least decent in some sense. Meanwhile, also it's very tricky to make experiments and I'm happy that, that I'm looking at experiments but, but I do not have to perform them. Because there is really a huge fight that each improvement of an experiment was swinging the pendulum from it works to it doesn't work. So one group said, we have fixed it, now it works. The next group said, no, but your rotation is it's not completely aligned and you just have artifacts of this. And right now there's a huge fight between the Princeton group and the Maryland groups, which have two experiments of this kind and they get different answers to it. And one say, you cannot measure, and the other one said, your setup is not proper. So it's great. But we are just watching what they are doing 
and look for instabilities which we can use already because they are working on the computer. So there's for instance we need to hide to turbulence, so we need rotation instability, which I will talk a little bit more about later. Uh, there is now the Rossby wave instability. I'm mentioning this here because it's very important to transform zonal flows, so to speak, pressure maxima into vortices and in the other way around. But they are not able to explain general turbulence in a disk. But I have it in here because at least it leads to structure in disks. Then there are a few new instabilities. Uh, you will see these are publications from 2013 and 14. A convective overstability, I will mention a little bit later. A gold ratio of trigger instability. Some of you might already know from the stability of rotating stars. So it was just replaced now into disks and then some critical layer instability. But let's start with the magnetorotational rotational instability. So this is a simulation here performed by Mario Flock a few years ago. It was the first global simulation of MHD turbulence in a disk which did not need some imposed external field. So he was really proud of this and, and with the light. So because he was just burning millions of CPU hours at very high resolution, it was able to have a, a self-sustained dynamic process in this disk. What you see here are the velocity fluctuations, so they are weaker in the mid-plane than in the upper layer, and uh, so every turbulence is subsonic, and you can now start to investigate what the structure of this turbulence is. We are interested in these structures because these structures might be able to track dust trends. For instance, if there is a vortex forming in such a disk, then it's concentrating dust in its center, in its high pressure center. And also, if solar flows are forming, that in your radial distance, you have some local uh, confined radial pressure maximum, then also dust grains will all pile up at this location here. So, uh, you can do prove this here by putting up some simple equations which tell you that dust simply wants to move to the location where pressure is the largest. So, the simulations I just had shown you before were actually using ideal MHD. But ideal MHD means that you have a very high number of free electrons in your, in your fluid in your gas. But the dead gas disk around a young star is relatively cold, so there is not just ionized hydrogen around. And at the same time, you have a lot of small dust grains. And these dust grains are crapping and catching like, a, like, like such a flycatcher all the free electrons which are uh, whizzing around there. So the ionization rate is so low that you do not have sufficient collisions between electrons and, 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 your, and your gas per orbit in order to sustain energy processes. So in this simulation, very recent, only accepted actually last week, um, Mario Flock has been using some recipe here for realistic ionization structures, so it's not ideal MHD simulations, where on the left uh, dust is at the nominal dust to gas ratio, and for the right side he has efficiently reduced the effect of dust, which might be having less dust grains because it already is grown, or in general really slightly larger dust. Here, so you see already on the left side it's a little bit more dead because it's blue in the center without much structure, on the right side it's a little less dead. But in both cases it's quite challenged by the low ionization rates. So, and if you are looking at what kind of flow pattern patterns show up in there, then you see that you, especially at the transitions between various ionization rates or various coupling to the MHD zones, then you find that also rings are forming in this simulation. So that the yellow is the density, it's a high density in the center, but then that actually here a ring has been forming at this one radius, where it's basically a transition between two different coupling strains to the turbulence. And if you look to the lower plot, then you not only see the ring forming, but there's also a slightly brighter region on the upper left here, which at the same time again is a high pressure region. If you look to the right, then we have plotted vorticity. You see that these are really perturbations in the rotation profile. You see them here as this dance with some vortical structure in it. And especially here, this vortex can be nicely observed. I'm, I'm showing you this simulation, the structure, which is a result from just the non-ideal MHD simulations.
because people are hunting for gaps in disks. Because, of course, the most popular explanation for any vortex and for any gap right now in the disk is that a planet has already formed and is carving this gap out of the system. And it was again also only last week when this wonderful image of HL Tau was published. Unfortunately, not already with surface density distributions, temperatures, and all the stuff, just a JPEG where we had to do some guesstimates from. But again, you see that again a lot of rings have been formed in here. And of course, the most popular uh, explanation right now is to explain that every time you see a gap, there's a little planet sitting, and if you have a have it on the, in the higher resolution that you see, I think there's like eight, between like seven and eight different gaps you find in there. And then it would be interesting to find uh, whether it's possible to have that many closely packed planets which are at the same time so massive that they are opening these wonderful gaps. So it might be an idea that these all these structures are not actually the effect of planets, but actually just things like here, these zone flows, which we have been observing. That you have here transition zones between different coupling strengths to the turbulence, between tur different drivers of turbulence, and so forth. So, but we have to wait until our simulations are a little bit further advanced, that we can actually study this model. So, if you are, want now to understand how planets are formed, then most of the time we need high resolution and therefore we do little tiny boxes cut out of the disk and, and study what is happening in such a little tiny box. And for instance, a few years ago we then had been throwing dust grains into such a box. In the box also a huge zonal flow has been forming, a deviation from the mean rotation profile. And in this zonal flow, the dust grains, which are indicated by blue color here, were concentrating, were getting trapped up to a value when the local Roche density was reached. So as soon as the Roche density is reached, you will find a circle here. Uh, come on, hurry up. Yes, here. So this means density is larger than the local rush density, and you have now found a gravity dominant object in this stuff here, which is then continuing to accrete more and more uh, material, which was actually then the onset of what, uh, what we call now the pebble accretion zone. So it does not stay at the initial size, but the masses are very quickly increasing here. It's right now not completely understood what the MHD state of the disk is. I told you before that uh, MHD turbulence is challenged by the low ionization rate. So this first comes up in a term called resistivity, so the free motion between electrons and the rest of the stuff. But there are two more nasty, uh, MA, non ideal MHD terms, which is ambipolar diffusion and, and Hall, the Hall term. And which, which all have different behaviors on, uh, on the stability of a disk. So when people were only introducing the resistivity, we were creating a certain dead zone here, and we had active MRI, active layers on top or below of this. But as soon as any polar diffusion was introduced, also these regions were dead. And now recently, when they again introduced um, the whole term into that, something funny occurred. Then suddenly things were active again in the midplane, but not in a turbulent way, but in a laminar one. This means as soon as you have now all non ideal MHD terms in it, there are magnetic fields generated, which are producing some constant radio transport of mass without being turbulent. So you have your alpha values and random stresses, but you don't have turbulence. So, and what this means, we still have to figure out. But they also reported that in this region, strong zonal flows were formed. So, has to be shown later. What happens now in a region which is completely dead and in which no turbulence exists? In such a region, you can now start to uh, study effects here like thermal convection. So this was a thermal convection simulation I was doing at the end of my PhD thesis when it was just starting here now uh, in, in 99, a postdoc was Peter Bodenheimer. So this is a radial distance, as a Musel distance, and we have we found that in this 3D simulation of radiation hydrodynamics of a disk, 
then some vortices were forming, and then it took me many years afterwards to figure out why. The problem was that this model was binding to rich in physics. So it was not a simple toy model, but it was having 3D rotation, equation of state, radiation transport. There was too much things in to really identify quickly the source of what happens. So we had to simplify the system, and simplifying the system meant that we were reducing the, the dimensions, we were making just a vertically integrated disk, and found out in the end that it's actually the temperature gradient in the midplane which produces a, an entropy gradient, which then leads to vortices. So we could prove this numerically, whenever we were switching off the entropy gradient, the disk was stable, we were switching it on again, there were vortices forming. And, uh, but we were not able to find a linear theory for this. So I failed with this when I was already in Heidelberg in 2004, and also some of my colleagues, Johnson and Danny, also found no linear instability. The reason is that even there would be convection in the disk based on the radial stratification of it, the rotation is too strong. So rotation does not like convection, so it's simply stopping it and says if, you, if the growth rate is long, is, uh, the growth rate is weaker than the shear rate, then you cannot form things. And, but then four years later, uh, finally in 2007, yes, 2007, then Peters and Stewart found we can find it in numerical simulations if we are controlling thermal relaxation. So it's different than a normal thermal convection. In normal thermal convection, you do not want to have thermal relaxation. Then you simply want to have something hot and something cold, and then you get very strong flows in between. As soon as, uh, it's the same as in the sun, so as soon as you start to have high heat conductivity between heating and cooling, you will shut off the, the, the convection because the heat doesn't have to go through convection anymore. So here it's different, so I first show you the movie, so of a small perturbation in a disk, again a box simulation, and you see that how these structures, little vortices are forming, little convection cells in the radial direction, uh, torn apart here by the shear and by the rotation, and they are getting stronger and stronger in the system. So if you make a schematic, then the idea is the following. Uh, regions closer to the star are warmer, regions farther away are colder, and the vortex sitting in the midplane with a rotation axis parallel to the rotation axis of the sun, of the star, of, of the entire disk even is now acting as a convection cell, transporting high entropy material to larger radii, then giving away its heat here to this, uh, to this reservoir of cold gas, and then cooler gas is streaming back in again. And then you just have the treatment here as a normal convection cell. So this has been shown now to work in 3D stratified simulations here by colleagues Lesuya and Papa Loiseau. They initially wanted to disprove us, but then uh, it was very helpful what they figured out, this was really kind. Uh, they had worried that there would be three-dimensional instabilities in such a vortex, which would destroy them after all. But they found out that they can be really stable if they are pretty far elongated. But these were local simulations, so I was interested in vertically stratified simulations, because then things might become different. And there I already had problems with the setup. So already axisymmetric simple things were always going turbulent, something which I had never seen before. So I was worried that my code does not work. And uh, but eventually I had to believe it. I was trying it with two different codes. I had axisymmetric setups, so no as a loosened structure of vortices, but still things were always very turbulent, especially at high resolutions. So at this time I met Richard Nelson who then had put out in, in, uh, yes, a preprint, and he found one instability acting under these conditions for a disk which has a radial temperature gradient and is otherwise completely isothermal. The point here is that the rotation profile of such a disk is no longer, as in a completely isothermal case everywhere, in a completely isothermal case everywhere in the disk, you would have constant rotation on cylinders. But as soon as you have a radial temperature gradient, you can use your equations, then you find this expression, that there is now vertical shear in the system. 
so that the further you are away from the midplane, the slower is the rotation of your disc. This leads to local vertical shear, and actually, if one is a little bit more careful with this, to a modification of the Rayleigh criterion I mentioned before. So still, you have the case that if you go outward radially, angular momentum is, uh, is increasing and stable. But if you now go not only outward, but also not upward, you can get into regions which are at lower angular momentum. And this has a very strong consequence. So these are now your contours of constant rotation, as I said before, slightly parabolic, so in radius and in vertical height. If you're overplotting now angular momentum, you see it's outward bent, black line. If you're now overplotting uh, specific energy, kinetic energy, then you see it's also bound inward, this red line. And now you already see what happens. You have now a small gas parcel, you can move it up and down as long as you are conserving angular momentum. But if you now move it upward, it gets into a region where the surrounding material has lower angular momentum. And this gives you now the release of free energy and your disk is wonderfully hydrodynamically unstable. So, as I show you the movie of such a simulation by Richard Nelson, you see then how this works, especially in the upper atmosphere, by very strong, narrow vertical motion. So this is velocity, this is velocity. But remember, the disk is vertically stably stratified. Density is increasing, temperature is constant, and this means you cannot simply move your parcels up and down, because as soon as you would move them upward, they are cooling adiabatically, and so they would fall back again, stably stratified. So, and so it only works if your disk has a very fast thermal relaxation. So it has to be cooler, cooling down, and time scales shorter than the orbital period, much shorter than this, and only then you can get into this uh, regime here. So, the, oops, yeah. So, but we were doing uh, simulations at much longer cooling times orbital frequency times cooling time, uh, having a factor of 10. Um, if we are doing this, then things are not growing that fast. This is already a movie. Even it looks like, uh, sorry, <laughs> even it looks like just a, a single frame. So it takes much longer. I'm just jumping forward, and then you see that also here structures are forming in our simulation. So this is again velocity. But it's not only just vertical up and down motion, these are all little convection cells which are forming in the disk here. But in a band structure because of the shear, and they are all little here transport behavior between inside and outside. And this again is now a new instability, it's a convective overstability, and we only published this uh, earlier this year. So. We were able to put out some numerical expressions. You can find the uh, analytic expressions in this paper plan Hubbard 2014, where we were able to derive the analytic expression and also test it in numerical simulations. So now we have two different instabilities. So this is a little bit uh, confusing now. What is when important? So we had been doing then some work together with a very bright Chinese student who was only here for a small bachelor thesis, but we were, he was able to handle all the equations I gave to him. So I was giving him here this, uh, oops, this very simple hydrodynamic system, which you probably all have seen at some point. It's, everything is very much standard in here, advection of density, advection of entropy, and here your velocity equations. But we put in here one additional term, and this is thermal relaxation. So the study had been studied, the system had been studied before by Dr. Rudiger, but he didn't find any instability in it, because he did not have the thermal relaxation term. But when we were putting it in, so one day, uh, Ming Zong and I ended at this very confusing system of equations. So it's a fifth order complex dispersion relation, something really ugly. And the individual terms are also very complicated. So, but you can now put in any arbitrary disk structure into the system and then ask, is it stable or unstable? And you can ask for growth rates and test them. So we have put this in this diagram in here. On the uh, y-axis, these are the growth rates. So again, in the orbital periods. 
So on the, on the lower axis you find here this control parameter, how fast is thermal relaxation in comparison to the orbital frequency. So this means very long cooling times, very short cooling times. And we found two different behaviors, so depending on where we are on the disk. So if we are at very short cooling times and consider modes which are very slender and vertical, we were finding here this gold ratio about friction instability I have mentioned before. And if we are at longer cooling times, then you find here this wonderful convective overstability in the system. And uh, then of course the question is, what will eventually operate in the disk? So and this is why the student at the institute, Nick Manugin, is now compiling here some nice uh, cooling curves for disks because we want to know what region is now susceptible to what kind of instability. So this is now 1 to 100 AU at various heights in the disk and color code is now here thermal relaxation time. So everything between 100 and 10, so the orange regions are very super stable, so very long growth rates for convective overstability. Then uh, between 0.1 and 0.001, you have the transition between convective overstability and, and this gold ratio with friction instability, which should be somewhere here along this blue dotted line. This means the upper atmosphere might have, in fact, this gold ratio by trigger instability, also here at larger radii, but the inner part of the disk should have this convective behavior, which then also leads to vortices. So, uh, overall, I just want to mention one more instability, just to confuse you even a little bit more, because Phil Marcus is a nice guy, and he's working on this kind of instability, he calls it uh, zombie vortices, and it's a complicated nonlinear effect in discs. So, what he has, he has seen this first in American simulations and still tries to understand what happens. So, this is a radial direction, this is a vertical direction of a disc. He has put in at some height above the mid plane an initial vortex in it, and this vortex was now starting to self replicate. So, just like in a, in a nice computer toy model. So, just like in this uh, grid pattern, he was having more and more vortices over time. The idea is that one individual vortex is emitting shedding waves. These waves are, uh, are in, in, exactly in this and, and, and St. Andrew's cross pattern propagating through the disk and then getting into some resonance catastrophe. And wherever this resonance catastrophe happens, the next vortex will be born. So what they need here, for instance, is an infinitely long thermal relaxation time because they want to have the same stratified, otherwise the, uh, the individual waves cannot propagate, so it would die. So, in the end, I'm coming to the end of my talk, in the end you see there are a lot of reasons why uh, there should be turbulence in a disk, even we cannot right now identify who is the main and most important agent, and that a system which is rotating and in which some turbulence is acting on small scales will also form some large scale structures. You can see this here in this rotation profile of Jupiter. The bands is known by everyone, but you should know that these bands are generated because they are rotating at different speed around uh, Jupiter. And the same structure is what I believe right now that we see is forming in, uh, is now also being in the future observed in protoplanetary disks. So, of course, now we have either vortices or on the right hand side zonal flows. In these zonal flows, we're concentrating material, and once you have concentrated enough material, that's the idea right now, um, and also already getting implemented in, um, uh, in, in American models, here also in Keith's group, that this now leads to some efficient formation of planetesimals. I'm looking for my final slide. Oh, I forgot my final slide. Sorry. Um, did I jump over? No, here it's. Okay. So I'm coming here to my conclusions. I've put up here uh, three recent publications dealing with the moon instabilities, one year by Richard Nelson and colleagues on the gold ratio with trigger instability, which of course you also find in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s nicely discussed in stellar rotation books and the convective overstability, Clara Hubbard and Lyra 2014. 
Um, this was, again, very disappointing or, let's say, exciting. Um, depends on what few angle you have. Um, you have just discovered something, such a cold connected overstability. So first you are fighting your colleagues, which tell you this is all nonsense, this can never happen. Then the next time you meet them, it was actually at just at one conference, 10 minutes later they say, yes, it might work, but it's not relevant. And then you meet the next guy around the corner and tells you, oh yes, this is the oscillatory mode of convection, and we have known forever that this would exist. But of course, 20, 20 years ago, nobody told me so. So there are some new, or at least say rediscovered instabilities that should occur in sufficiently energy dead disks. So, but also if there are transitions in the variability of deadness of disk, you also get structures. The three properties and fight of war disease is still under discussions, and now it's time to burn a lot of CPU hours on big computers to figure out what the overall structure and the fate of these objects and instabilities will be in the end. So, I'm coming to my end, and thank you very much for your interest. But you will have to help us in the end to exclude one or the other instability. So it's in the end of the day just observations which can tell us what happens. So uh, in the end it, it's a little bit confusing. So we, for, for many years we learned in school that if you need a rotation instability, something you can draw on the back of an envelope and explain to kids how this works. And this would do cheerless discs and period, and that's the end of the story. But if you talk to people dealing with atmospheric structures of the Earth, uh, they do not deal with one instability, it's many instabilities. There are instabilities acting on the shear, there are instabilities of convective nature, instabilities based on overstability of certain waves. And even they have problems to decide for certain weather phenomena or just flow phenomena in the upper atmosphere to identify what is in the end uh, precisely your, the, the exact reason for this. There is one wind which changes its direction on a two weeks period somewhere at 50 kilometers height and, and they still have, they are fighting at conferences. What is the reason for this? Is it waves? Is it overstability? So, and, and I think we have to, to understand meanwhile that we have a lot of ideas of individual processes of disks, but the question is not which one is important and which one isn't, so but to see how the interplay of everything is. And before we are at a state that we can do a climate model for a disk and predict how it will evolve in detail, so it's a, it's a long way down. So, but we are happy for all new discoveries and measurements of this properties. So, so you see this slightly on, on the upper right plot. So it's again such a sheet simulation where, uh, where you have the bottom.
vortex, but the vortex is not simply sitting there. You also see there are density waves. So the vortices are generating spiral density waves, and these density waves are transporting in momentum. So this means from, from these kind of instabilities, you can infer how efficient they are locally in angular momentum transport, and then apply these values for global simulations. And then see again whether this makes sense or not. So um, this is also uh, something where uh, observation will have a lot of fun because these spiral waves are not features of the vortices, they are generic disk features. So these kind of spirals here are driven both in MRI simulations as well as in simulations here of convective overstabilities. It's basically just like uh, an eigenmode of the disk, so if you bang on it, it will have these spirals, and you don't know what the hammer was. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned these tailored wedge flow models, uh, experiments, experiments sorry, mm -hmm. uh, that they do in the laboratory. Um, but they, these things have maybe the same rotation. You can set them up and have the same rotation pattern as this, but not the same gravity. Mm -hmm. um, has, would there be any kind of way to include uh, that, or that doesn't matter that there is uh, this gravity? So we, we have been thinking about this, so we, you, of course there is one gravity component of course existing, but just in the vertical direction. So this is bad, especially if you're looking for a covalent effect. But typically the rotation frequencies are so large that everything is dominated by centrifugal acceleration. And this means you have basically the reverse pressure structure than what you would have in a disk. In a disk, you have the pressure decreasing inward to the outer stuff, and there you have the pressure increase radially. So, and, and this means also that if you want to drive now convection in such a system, then you're not allowed to heat from the inside, but you would have to heat from the outside. So, but we hope that all the equations are symmetric, and that um, you can reverse everything and again study the system which you actually were attending. So, uh, about the comparison of the Zonal Pro and uh, the ALMA data, uh, the ALMA data is dust continuum, but the Zonal Pro is the gas. So, yes. you need further steps that uh, dust accumulation. Uh, and I'm wondering that uh, the time scale of the Zonal Pro is sufficient or not for accumulated dust rain. So, do you have any comments on that? We, th this was also work we have been done uh, a few years ago here by. Carsten Dittrich, 2013. So we, this is shear and sheet simulations of larger and larger distance. Remember, I was showing you the movie before when uh, self gravity was leading the planetesimals in such a line. This was one of the original ones of Anders Johansen, and this was one by one pressure scalite, which means it was such a tiny box here. And in this run, the zonal flows were only living for a few orbits and then they were gone again. So this means we were only able to concentrate 50 centimeters, 60 centimeters boulders because they were mobile enough. And we know already these are very unlikely to exist in disks. So in Carsten's work, we were studying the following effect. We were using larger and larger boxes because already from initial experiments we had the idea that the larger the box is, the longer the zonal flow might live. And then, of course, we had to push this to a limit. Um, okay, almost the shear and sheet approximation breaks down, but we were pushing it to a limit, limit when we came into convergence. And convergence means that um, initially we were making the box larger and the zone flow got wider. We were larger and the zone flow got wider. But then, starting from some size, which is here 10 pressure scalites in radius and azimuth, we were finally having convergence that we had two zone flows in. And then we knew if we further increase this, we only get more zonal flows and not larger ones. And in those simulations, the lifetime of the zonal flows were up, was up to 100 orbits because they were getting destroyed and regenerating them at some other radii. And this 100 orbits means that we can also concentrate dust planes which are 10 times smaller. But if you're looking for the distances where the uh, IMA images are taken 
So um, millimeter particles might be very well the, the most mobile particles anyway, and quickly follow the structure of such a uh, of such a zonal flow. And then it might be that this, if this is zonal flows, then we simply have to wait for 100 orbits, which is 20,000 years. And uh, then it might look different because the zonal flows are at other locations. If I, if I may actually uh, continue on yes. this, if you say these zonal flows live maybe 100 orbits, mm -hmm. then uh, there is not enough time for the for communication of the signal essentially to go all across the circle of this. So you expect to have little patches of zonal flows, around, but not one entire ring around this, because how could uh, Sound waves don't have the time to propagate all around, and then, or maybe they have it in, 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 in 20 orbits or 30 orbits, but maybe only once or twice. So it, it, there you see that effect. You see like little patches of, 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 of zone flows, but not large scale, grand, grand scale uh, ring structures. Uh, whereas these ring structures are the ones that we see. So is there any way to? to kind of let these zonal flows live longer so that they can actually merge and become one big or several big rings rather than the mm -hmm. So, so one, one additional information for these plots is that, that even you have zonal flows, which are these mean perturbations, you have again still these spiral rays propagating on this. And this makes it look patchy. So, but, but if you are then using some as and as an average, then you get the zonal flow component of it. And, and uh, at, at least for 10 precious thenite, we found that coherence was established within this build-up of, uh, let's say there's a build-up time of 100 orbits, and then a lifetime for 100 orbits. So, uh, but if again, I also had this question recently, the exact formation mechanism of some of those is not understood. And this is not only to blame the, the disk people, which only started to study this a few years ago, also the Jupiter's dense structures. They also do not know exactly how they form, because they have no depth information. So is the, the band which you see the zone flow a surface phenomenon of just a few kilometers or a few precious canines, or is it going really far down? So, but you're right, so there's still a lot of things to do with the understanding of zone flows. <laughs>